Another month has gone by and it's time for an update on my uh, Game A Day challenge that I'm doing. So, hi, first of all, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, please like and subscribe and do all the common stuff because it's good for the algorithm and the algorithm likes it and if the algorithm likes it, then I like it and it makes everyone happy except for you because you just have to comment for no good reason. I mean... It's nice, I guess. Anyways, let's go ahead and go into this. So basically, uh, about a month ago, I did a video talking about how I'm doing a game a day challenge. The basic idea is I'm trying to play a game that is new to me every single day of the year. Not specifically for the sake of playing a new game every day, but because having gotten into content creation two years ago, I found my unplayed games piling up as I focus more on, on, on you know, prototype copies or copies that publishers are sending me, and my own collection of games or Kickstarters or all these things start piling up. What used to be a manageable collection has started growing, which is very much first world problems to be clear, but I, I like getting these things in control and so I decided that this year I have a challenge where I play a new game every single day. You can find out more if you want to check out the other video, I'll link to that down below, but that's really all you need to know. And to that end, what I'm going through is I'm playing all these new games, I'm marking them down, and then once a month I'm doing an update video covering the games I played, in this case it's February, which means I have 28 games that I've played in February, and we're going to talk about them. A whole bunch of games, many of these will not show up in other videos, many of these will. Some of these will show up in my games leaving the collection, others will be games I reviewed, other games will be games that I'm going to review, and so, I mean, you could skip this entire video and you'll find out probably like 60% of my, my thoughts on these games and in other videos. But with that said, timestamps down below in case you want to just, you know, skip to the ones you don't know anything about. And let's go ahead and start this off. Starting off with the one that I almost put in last video by mistake. I had this on the table to talk about and then I got to the end of my video and I was like, wait a second, this is actually my February 1st game of the day. To be clear, by the way, it's not necessarily that I play a new game every day. If I play three games today, it counts for the next three days. So I can get ahead of the curve that way. In any case, starting off with Marvel United X-Men. I had a chance to play Marvel United X-Men and for context, I am including offshoots and expansions in my new game of the day context. Uh, but Marvel United X-Men, I dove into this one. I'm still waiting for my all-in pledge. I've started to see pictures. It looks like a lot of stuff. I'm very excited. Not that I should be because I still haven't played all my regular Marvel United. I've played it a lot, just not all of it. But I like Marvel United X-Men. I like Marvel United. I like Marvel United X-Men. I think that thematically, I still prefer the world of Marvel United. I'm more attached or entrenched in that world. But uh, in terms of mechanically, I still like X-Men and mechanically, I think it does a little bit better. A lot of the new things we'll see in the Kickstarter extras and the all-in but does some small stuff like starting with cards in your hand or characters that could be heroes or villains. Overall, if you like Marvel United, I would say if you're ambivalent on the theme, I would definitely recommend X-Men over Marvel United. Uh, if you're completely ambivalent on the theme, honestly, I'd recommend passing on both. I think both these games are charming and very accessible and has very, very strongly risen in my personal ranks. But at the end of the day, there are lighter games. And so if you're completely ambivalent on the theme, don't get either. If you like both themes, but you don't particularly care that strongly, get X-Men. Past that, I don't think the differences are strong enough for me to recommend one or the other over themes. Meaning if you like the Marvel theme more than the X-Men theme, I'd, I'd go with the Marvel theme. And I know I'll get comments, but X-Men is Marvel. I, you know what I'm talking about. I mean like the MCU main cast of characters as opposed to the X-Men. But that's basically it. I enjoyed it. It's great. It's solid. Another good addition. And I'm happy I backed all the stuff. So that's uh, Marvel United. From there we have Trekking the World. Trekking the World. Uh, we have Trekking the World over here. I think I have Trekking Through History somewhere on the upcoming ones too. We'll talk about that. Trekking the World. You can expect a review of this one at some point. So if you want, you can skip this section. I like it. Uh, I enjoy the simple set collection. It's not a game I love. It's one that I, I've dived into to it, you're moving around the map, you're trying to navigate around how to see these sites or do different actions to basically most efficiently take advantage of, well, basically moving around the board, set collection, grabbing cards, using those cards for movement. It's a fun, quick little system. It's not amazing. It's lighter. It's accessible. It's a great gateway game. It's one that I'm happy to table, but also if my family didn't like it, I'd probably never play it again. Uh, my wife and my daughter both enjoy it, so it will see the table again. It will stick around the collection, but I enjoy tracking the world. I recommend it as a gateway experience, and that's where it ends. As far as next up, uh, we have Mercurial. Mercurial is a game that should be coming to Kickstarter at some point. It's one that I dove into and didn't particularly love it, so I, I'm not covering that one. I thought it was good. I thought it was solid, but I, I mostly compared it in my head to uh, Century Golem Edition, and I just vastly prefer Century Golem Edition. I found Mercurial added a degree of complexity without necessarily making the game better. It just made it a little more complex, and so I 
just directly prefer Century Gollum Edition. From there we have Bus. Uh, Bus is a game from Capstone Games and from Splatter, and it's one that I never had a chance to try until, well, well now, that's why it's on this list. But I had a chance to play it with Quacklove, there's actually a film gameplay over on his channel, and I'm absolutely picking up a copy of myself. Really enjoyed my playthrough of it, it very much falls in line with Splatter games, in which everything matters so much. A fairly simple game to teach, but incredibly nuanced and tactical in just the depth of the experience and how you can cut others off and try to take advantage of the very few actions going on to, well, get the best experience you can. Incredibly tactical, really solidly enjoy it. Enjoy it. I need to play it more to see where it lands. Once I play, get enough plays in, I will likely review it because I like Splatter games. Although that said, I haven't reviewed Food Chain Magnet officially, and I definitely should do that because Food Chain Magnet is fantastic. Uh, from there, we have Unsettled. Unsettled is one that I did review. You can see a review on the channel. I gave it a 5 out of 5. I absolutely adore Unsettled. Uh, there's some caveats to my review. You can check that out. But effectively, it is an exploration game from Orange Nebula. Same same people have brought you Vindication, and I think it shows, at least for myself, for me, Vindication and Unsettled both give me the same resource optimization feeling. Although Unsettled, I think, uh, has better and worse aspects to it. Worse is the aspect of the fact that it's cooperative. I, I find cooperative games are great, but I, I find they have a harder time hitting the same highs as competitive games. Like, it just, I mean, I have a few cooperative games in my top 10 or whatever it is, but nonetheless, I find that it's a little harder to hit that note. But overall, I, I really enjoy Unsettled. Uh, the other aspects, the aspects of Unsettled I think is better is the fact that the, the they do a better job of the thematic immersion aspect of the sense of survival you have going on. I really like it, really enjoy it, am eager to dive back into it and to dive into all the planets and whatever new content they have in the new Kickstarter. Uh, from there we have Lagrania. Lagrania, the, the new big box version, I had a chance to play that. I've played the original Lagrania, but because we played this with modules and new big box, I, I counted it because because why not? But Lagrania is one that I, I got a chance to table it a few times and go into it. It's one that I, I still get, need to get a sense of the feel of the modules. I gave it a 4 to 5. I really enjoy Lagrania. It's a solid experience, but it's one that if the other modules that are in the Kickstarter, and some of the modules that they have in the actual prototype, I didn't get a chance to t play all of them, but depending on how the modules go, it's either going to be a game I dive into a few more times and move on from, or the modules will elevate it for me, making it a better game. I compare it to Glenn Moore in that sense. It gave me a lot of the same feeling as Glenn Moore did, in the sense that Glenn Moore is always a great game, but I needed the addition of the modules for it to be a game that stuck around in my collection. I think that holds true for Lagrania as well. Uh, from there we have My Little Pot, My Little Scythe Pie in the Sky. This is an expansion to My Little Scythe. My Little Scythe is a game that I am willing to play with my children, but don't love myself. I enjoy it without loving it, but my kids like it, and the Pie in the, the, pie in the Sky expansion is, I mean, it's just more fun stuff. It's not essential, not by any means. I think that, I mean, I'll probably review it at some point because I haven't actually reviewed My Little Scythe yet, and I probably should do that. But I would say that, yeah, if you enjoy My Little Scythe and you need everything, go ahead and get it. If not, it adds some, some extra stuff, but nothing nothing really essential to the experience. Just some, some, some nice extras. From there, we have New York Zoo. New York Zoo is going to be Uwe Rosenberg's uh, another polyomino game, often compared to Baron Park. I greatly prefer Baron Park personally, although in general, Baron Park to me has been one of the gold standards of polyomino games, and I find most games I try to play and compare it to do come up a bit short, at least compared to Baron Park. But I did enjoy New York Zoo. It has, it, it's interesting enough, it manages to combine Uwe's kind of style of trying to build up your your, your farm or whatnot, because you have your resource, your livestock that are going into your polyomino pens, but then they're breeding. So it has that like semi Uwe aspect. It almost would be, it almost would be a great gateway to those heavier Uwe games for people who want to slowly move their way get there from lighter games while still managing to be incredibly light. But it would give you that sense of that mindfulness of okay, great, I have to optimize around the now, but also around getting my engine up and running. But it, it's good, it's fun, it's enjoyable. Get good without being great, at least for myself. Uh, next up, we have It's a Wonderful Kingdom. It's a Wonderful Kingdom is the two-player version of It's a Wonderful World. I, I want to play it a few more times and get reviews. I get a review of it in, but right now I only have one player under my belt, and it has a few modules. So I kind of want to dive into each of the modules, get a feel for how different they are and what they add to the experience. Based on one play, it does a decent job capturing what I liked about It's a Wonderful World, while also doing a decent job capturing what made me uncertain about It's a Wonderful World. It's a Wonderful World is a game that I really liked, played it a few times, and eventually got rid of. I actually did get it back because of the fact that I kind of have this... I think it's one of those games I think I like it more than I do, but I need to dive into it again and see where it ends up. I, I, might, I, I think that It's a Wonderful World is probably a game I'll be getting rid of, and It's a Wonderful Kingdom, at least based on one play, I believe it will likely go in that direction. I enjoy it, don't get me wrong, I do enjoy it, but when I think about other two-player experiences I'd rather play, I just don't know if that will get tabled, which is part of the problem, by the way, because 
I played it, and this is how, this is why, in general, my reviews will drift towards positive, because I want to play It's a Wonderful Kingdom more times so that I can review it, but I'm not in a rush to play it, because I'd rather play games that are exciting to me, and It's a Wonderful Kingdom is... Good. I enjoyed it. Uh, instinctive re review after one play would be a 3.5, but I could dive into it again. I could see it growing to a 4, depending on how things go. I don't believe it would go lower than 3.5, but we'll see. I'll dive into it. it, it again, it does a good job catch capturing It's a Wonderful World in a two-player experience. That's the best thing I could say about it so far. From there, we have Reckland Run. Reckland Run is a uh, prototype copy that's on Kickstarter, or was on Kickstarter, depending on when this video goes up. Probably was on Kickstarter, uh, but I really enjoyed that one. It gave me a similar solo feels as... as um, What's it called? Uh, Under Falling Skies gave me a similar feeling of that game, but it's one that is, feels very different at the same time. I have not played Warp's Edge, so I cannot compare it to that, but comparing it to Under Falling Skies, I prefer Under Falling Skies while liking the variability that Reckland Run brings to the table. It does have a bit of a campaign aspect to it as you go through this experience, uh, this journey, uh, but uh, not so hard that it would be hard to pick up where you left off. So as long as I'm playing it semi-consistently, like even once a month, I could probably get through it uh, easily enough, but I like it. I'm, I'm looking forward to the final game. It's one that I am backing, and uh, overall enjoy it. Uh, next up, we have Kingdoms Forlorn. Kingdoms Forlorn, which is one that I did do a first impressions of. Uh, despite putting like 10 hours into it, I just the nature of the prototype and the experience I had, I, I felt like I couldn't call it more than first impressions. But I... I enjoyed some aspects of the game while overall not being that favorable for it. This is part of a bigger conversation of I am heavy, I am harder on heavier games. The heavier a game is, the more work it takes, the more rules overhead there is, the longer the experience, those all contribute to how good the game has to be for me to be forgiving of it. Like, uh, for Kingdoms Forlorn is easily a better game than Trekking the World to me, but Trekking the World is easy to table, easy to play, and so I'm far more favorable to it. So the higher that rules overhead, the, f the higher that barrier, the better a game has to be for me. For me, Kingdoms Forlorn just felt like a lot of work, a lot of rules, a lot of overhead, a lot of game time, and a campaign game to match, all for an experience that, to me, was good. And that's just, uh, that put me in a more of a not being that favorable towards it as a result. Is it okay? It was totally okay for me. And by the way, watch a lot of other content creators. I think a majority of content creators did like it, which I would not have thought, by the way. I would have thought that, I mean, it's just it's one of those things of extrapolating your own opinion onto the world. I would have thought people would have been harsher towards it. Clearly not. So I am very curious how it lands. I hope it is well received by everyone who backs it. Don't get me wrong. The last thing I need is people who don't like a game just so I can be like, I was right. That's not, that's not the point. I'd rather be wrong. Uh, from there, we have uh, Tracking Through History. Tracking Through History, the follow-up to Tracking the World. Uh, Tracking Through History was fun. My wife really liked it, so we're, we are backing it and getting it. But I prefer Tracking the World. I thought there was more agency and control over how you could actually progress throughout the game. Versus Tracking Through History, I felt a bit more victim to just the luck of what was available on the table. It's quick, it's simple, it has a set collection aspect, it clearly feels like part of a set that Trekking the World, Trekking the Parks, and Trekking Through History have, although I haven't played Trekking the Parks, so I can't really comment on that one. But for me, I prefer Trekking the World. But again, like I said, my wife likes it, so overall we'll be getting it. Uh, from there we have Iron Forest. Iron Forest, which is the follow-up of uh, from Ice Cool. That one is a game that's a tough one because I prefer it to Ice Cool, but Ice Cool is also a game that didn't stay in my collection. I was hoping that Iron Force would be enough of an escalation in what the games bring that I'd want to keep it. Ultimately, for me, it still has a lot of the same flicking fun, but it also has some aspects to it that just make the game less likely to be tabled, at least based on my prototype experience. Like, the double level aspect it feels more like a gimmick than anything else. I like the campaign aspect. I kind of wish I had Ice Cool with a campaign mindset to it, but I like the flicking, I like the balancing, it has an addictive aspect to it, while also being a game that I just don't feel the need to own. Most flicking or dexterity games do fall in the category. I enjoy them, but don't feel the need to own them. There are a few exceptions. Crokinole's one... Uh, I don't know what else. Real-time dexterity. They often find, like, Project Elite is my go-to real-time. Crokinole is my go-to dexterity. Other games tend to just uh, be fun experiences that I move on from. Then we have Ares Expedition Expansions over here. This one, I'm guessing, depending on when videos go up, I'm guessing you see this video before my official review of Ares, Ares Expedition Expansions. But the expansions have a few different options. They have Discovery, Foundations, and Crisis, bringing you new things to the experience. But I think the biggest thing, the biggest change which I'll focus on here, is the Crisis Expansion, which turns it into a cooperative experience. So you can be playing multiple players cooperatively at Terraforming Mars or his expeditions. I think it does a great job. It works really well. It comes down to the wire. I've played it multiple times, both solo and with other players, and so far, really, really enjoying what Crisis adds. There are some aspects of it that feel a bit fiddly, So, and that's the nature of having a cooperative game placed on top of a non-cooperative experience. 
So they have, there are some aspects that feel a bit fiddly. I would say that my aversion to the fiddliness was stronger after a single game and got progressively weaker as I played it more. So it's something that I'm still going to be putting in my review as something to be mindful of, but it definitely had a drop off as I got used to those changes and they felt more like part of the game as opposed to overlaid. They're still overlaid, I just got used to them. But I really liked it. I really thought Crisis was a... I mean, I don't see a reason to ever play... Ares Exhibition solo again, I think I would only ever play Ares Exhibition as the Crisis experience if I'm diving into it solo. I think. I, don't, I mean, time will tell, because the, the, the flip side of solo is it's a little easier to table, a little less stuff to set up, but I think I think that's where I would land. Uh, from there we have Bear Raid. Bear Raid, which is not on the table over here, but Bear Raid from Board Game Tables is one that's a stock uh, stock market manipulation game involving basically shorting stock and selling stock and buying stock and all those things designed by Ryan Courtney, the designer of Pipeline. I really enjoy Bear Raid. It's one that I will be getting multiple plays in and then reviewing it on the channel at some point. But it's like it goes head to head with Stockpile for me. Stockpile is a great game from Navu Games, Navu Games, and Stockpile has been my go-to like fun, quick stock market experience. Bear Raid might kick Stockpile out, and that's a shame because I keep meaning to review Stockpile, but I haven't actually reviewed it yet because I want to dive into all the modules. I find this happens to me with reviews where if I decide that I want to review more than the base game and I want to review all the modules and stuff, sometimes what happens is the review kind of doesn't happen for a long time because sometimes it's hard to table all the additional modules. It's easier to just dive into the base game and be like, we'll play with the modules tomorrow, and then tomorrow we play something else. So that has happened to me before. It'll happen again. I'll, I'll definitely review Stockpile before it leaves, and I'm not confident Stockpile leaves yet. Stockpile Stockpile does have elements that Barry does not that make me think there's a 40% chance that both of them stay and a 6% chance that Barry Raid replaces Stockpile. Again, there's, if I had to choose one, it's definitely Barry Raid, but at the same time, Stockpile brings things to the table that Barry Raid does not. So we'll talk about that more. There'll be a review at some point, probably, almost certainly, likely. Yeah, that. Uh, next up, we have Doomlings. Doomlings is a game that was sent to me for review. I, I basically told them, hey, this is a like a party experience that doesn't really see my jam. And that's true enough. It is a it is a party experience that's not really my jam. It is a it's a light little you know playing cards and just doing what the cards say to get points to put them into your gene pool across several rounds as you go through the destruction of the world. It's fun. It's light. I, I mean, I like the um, I like the art. I like the theme. Those things are all solid. In terms of the genre of games where you just draw cards and play cards and it's just about the craziness and the interference and getting in each other's ways, it's fine. I enjoy it, but I'm never gonna ask to play this one. It's a solid. It's a solid three. Again, the lighter an experience, the easier I am on it. <laughs> is, it as good as, is it as good as Kingdoms Forlorn? No, it's not. Would I rather play Doomlings than Kingdoms Forlorn? Weirdly, yes. Again, it's not about games being good or not. It's about the accessibility to good. It's a more complicated discussion. This is not meant to be a beating up in Kingdoms Forlorn video. But my point is, this is stupid enough and simple enough and easy enough to table that like, if Ricky wants to play it, like this, I haven't even decided this is leaving my collection. If Ricky wants to play it, this will stick around, and Ricky did like it, although she really prefers Hair to Slay, which gives you a lot of the similar feel of the experience. So from that sense, I think this actually will go. But if not for Hair to Slay, I think uh, Doomlings would stick around just because Ricky enjoys it. Next up, we have Earth. Earth from Inside Up Games. Currently a Kickstarter, or was a Kickstarter. Again, depends on when this video goes up. But Earth is a... Fun game with promise. I was not sold on Earth. I got a single play-in with Quacklope, uh, you know, covering it so he can review it and cover it. Not really review it, but cover the game. He really likes the game. I'm more mixed on it. I see a lot of promise of it, but it, to me it felt a little bit too open in terms of what was going on. It didn't feel like enough things mattered in, in what they were doing. Some aspects, yes. Some aspects just felt like, okay, great, just put these things out to get more points. Do that as efficiently as possible, which I guess could describe most games. Something about Earth, I wasn't quite feeling it. Again, single play, have not played it again. I, I kind of want to dive into it again, especially because of how much Jesse likes it. But, I'll, I mean, I'm, I'll happily table it, but I think I, I think I would table a final version of the game. Overall, where I am right now, probably a 3.5 in it, but that's based on one play, and it's being compared to the genre of Terraforming Mars, so it's, again, like, I tend to be harsher on games that are being compared against my favorites. So it's like, oh my gosh, you have this card building tableau engine. Well, I'd rather Earth's Expedition or Terraforming Mars than Earth, although I do want to try Earth again and see see where it is. Next up, we have Unsurmountable. Unsur Unsurmountable from Button Shy Games. Really a disappointment to me. Uh, I dove into that one a few times. It's a quick, you know, Button Shy little solo game. I dove into it a few times and just didn't find it rewarding, which is interesting because I totally thought that was up my, my alley. It's a solo game from Scott Alms. As you climb a mountain, as you play cards down, you can either use the ability on the card or place the card into the mountain to go up the mountain. I tried the expansions as well, the, the different mountain patterns they have, as well as just adding more cards, and I just didn't find it rewarding. I don't know what it was about it. I didn't, I don't know if I just didn't find it a challenge, didn't find it rewarding, a little bit of both, 
it's one that's that definitely leaving my collection uh for right now it's sticking around because i do plan on doing a full roundup video of like eight or nine different wallet games from button shy but unsurmountable was a disappointment for me i think a big disappointment because i was expecting a lot more from it and again again in general button shy games i find most of them are good uh, some of them are great and some of them are bad this one was good i just for some reason i thought this would fall into the great category from there we have Beyond the Sun. Beyond the Sun, which is a game from Rio Grande Games. I'll be playing that more and reviewing it at some point. It's been sitting on my shelf for a while wanting to get played. I finally managed to table it and really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it's one of those... I need to play it more to see exactly where it ends up, but it has a degree of optimization of trying to figure out these technology trees and moving along the technology trees. It could basically be called Technology Tree the Game, but you're using all those to manage a little side map of how you wander through space with your spaceships, getting control of different things. A lot of fun ways to build up your tableau and to slowly get your stuff out there, get your cubes, turn them into supplies, turn them into spaceships, turn them into, you know, researchers or scientists or whatever they're being as you spread around again these tech trees. I see why it's well loved. I don't think my degree of loving it is up to how well loved it is, at least not yet. But I, I do definitely like it. It's definitely one that's sticking around for now, unless I have a horrible second and third play, in which case then it's gone. But for right now, I really enjoy it. I'm looking forward to diving into it again. From there, we have Through the, Through the Ages, Leaders and Wonders. I've had this expansion for a year and have not tabled it. I will be diving into that shortly, or shortly ish, probably, maybe. But uh, Through the Leaders, Ages, Through the Ages, Leaders and Wonders is just more cards for Through the Ages. If you like Through the Ages, I think they're essential to mix up the experience to get you. A little bit out of those stale patterns of the best wonders and leaders. They have a quick little system as well as putting blank cards in and then drawing from a side deck in order to keep it as streamlined and balanced. I think that's the best way to play it to give you what you want from the experience. Although the first time you play it, you might just want to mix them all in and do that. I'm just getting into technicalities of how you mix and match things. Overall, if you like Through the Ages, I think Leaders and Wonders is essential and a quick way to uh, give you variety to your experience. From there, we have Mandala Stones. Mandala Stones from Board and Dice Games. I liked Mandala Stones while wondering how well it will do long term. It's an interesting mechanism of you have these four workers and you're putting down spots to gather various tokens from around the workers, a little bit of a rule system of how that works. But then you put those onto your own personal board and then at different points you can, instead of taking things, you can score your board. And then you remove all the top tiles while you try to figure out how to score each region. I'm getting a bit abstract in how I explain it. But that's the basic idea of what's going on. You're trying to most efficiently grab tiles, slot them to your board, and then score your board as rapidly as possible to get as many points as possible and do that more efficiently than the other players at the table. It's a game that plays two to four. Board Game Geek has this rated best at two, so I played it at two. I liked it. I really did. I also don't know if I liked it enough that it'll stick around long term or even for subsequent plays. At some point, you might get a full review if I played enough times or not if I if I don't. But I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed it without yet being sold. It actually feels similar to Garinto for me. Garinto as well is another one that falls in that category of, I really like you, but will I play you compared to other games I could table instead? Uh, next up, we have the Reckoners expansion. Uh, diving into the Reckoners Steel Slayer, the expansion to the Reckoners. Got to table that a few times, get into the various bosses and extra things that they add to the table. It adds new bosses, it adds new locations, it adds new Reckoners, it adds new equipment, a bunch of new stuff. I did a full review on the channel, you can check it out. Short version is if you're someone who plays the Reckoners a lot, I think it's great, tremendous. It brought Reckoners to a, from a 4 to a 4.5 for me personally, but it's one that also is expensive enough that if you're not playing the Reckoners often, I don't know if it's essential. It definitely gives a variety to my experience and it takes the Reckoners from a, well, a 4 to a 4.5, but I really like the Reckoners and so it's an easy investment on my end, but you have to decide for yourself whether it's worth it or not. Uh, next up we have Undo. Undo from Pegasus Spiel is a game that I'll be talking about in a bit of a series compilation as I compare Undo, Exit, Unlock, a bunch of these games in the genre. There is uh, Deckscape and Crime Zoom, a whole bunch of small little box detective games that I'll be comparing in a singular video series. Undo is one that has such an interesting premise and potential, and I think the end result is actually only good. It's a good game. I enjoyed my play of it. I have two more I'll be diving into, but I, I feel like the premise is so interesting but they kind of like they kind of have this amazing premise, and then they were kind of like, oh, but we can't really do that. That would be too complicated, and so they just gave you a good game instead. I found myself disappointed because of how good I thought it could be, and in the end, it's it's just good. I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong, but we'll talk about it more. But that's that's kind of where I am with Undo. Next up, we have Death Valley, another game from Button Shy, another little wallet game. Death Valley, I'm still undecided on. That, that's because Death Valley, I think, is meant to be played as a two-player experience. I've so far only dived into it solo. I enjoyed it solo. It was fun to go through it, but it's definitely one that I think is primarily meant as a two-player, and solo would have been kind of similar to Unsurmountable. It would have been a game that, oh, this is fun, but also I don't need to keep it. Uh, playing it two players as you try to basically line up these cards going on your journey and removing cards from your journey to your journal, 
Uh, this, those are the terms. Your journey to your scrapbook, that's what it is. But there's an interesting pushy luck mechanism as you try to figure out how to score while also trying to not lose the cards at the same time. Interesting little challenge, but I, like I said, I need to play two players before I make an official decision around where it goes. Next up, we have Tiny Ninja Heroes. Tiny Ninja Heroes is one. I already played Tiny Ninjas a while ago, but I finally dived into Tiny Ninja Heroes for the first time and found myself a little disappointed on that one. I prefer Tiny Ninja Heroes. I think it is a more abstracted system and it's better for it. I think Tiny Ninja Heroes adds rules overhead and a tactical grid without actually improving the experience and so that goes back to my general conversation around you know the balance of rules overhead and accessibility versus how much I like a game. I think both of them give you similar gameplay and Tiny Ninja Heroes just makes you work harder for the same level of gameplay. Arguably Tiny Ninja Ninjas is just better either way. But either way, uh, I enjoy Tiny Ninjas. Uh, Tiny Ninja Heroes for me was more of a letdown. Then we have Libertalia Winds of Galecrest. The new Libertalia from Stonemaier Games. Not on this table, despite me thinking it would be. Uh, Libertalia Winds of Galecrest is a new version of Libertalia from Stonemaier Games, like I just said. I have a full review on the channel. Short version is Libertalia is a game that I liked, but eventually left my collection over time. Uh, Winds of Galecrest, I think, is more likely to stick around for a while. But also, it depends. It gives me a lot of the same fun that games like Citadels do. That accessibility, a little bit of backstabbery, betrayal, trying to think through what your opponents are going to do and how to react according to that as you go through three rounds of gameplay trying to acquire as much loot as possible on a four, five, and six round journey. Lots of fun little things going on in it, but also it's one of those games that I like, but I, I can give it a four to five with the caveat that I've had worse games and experiences within it. I like Libertalia. I've always liked Libertalia. I think the Stormire Games is a much better production, although I know people who prefer the old art. I like both versions of the art, so I'm kind of fine either way. But overall, I like Libertalia, and I'm curious to see how well it does long-term in my collection. Depends if it gets tabled or not. It's a good game. It's a solid game. It depends ultimately if it gets tabled and how what happens when it does. Because one of my concerns is that sometimes Libertalia would give me mixed experiences because of the random nature of the cards, and so that could be a factor as well. Two more to go. We have This War of Mine. This War of Mine from... Where we got this from? From What's it called? From, um... Jeez. This War of Mine from Awakened Realms is a solid game of... Is it from Waking Realms? It's from Waking Realms. Why does it not have Waking Realms on the box? It has Galacta and 11-Bit Studios. That's an interesting conversation. That's an interesting conversation. Was Waking Realms not called Awakened Realms when they did this War of Mine? Now I'm curious. In any case, this War of Mine is a uh, solo survival experience. Technically, you can play with more players. It's rated best as, as a solo game, and I dove into it solo. Uh, this is one that I've been to dive into for a long time, ever since I did a video where I said the 10 worst games in Crackleup's collection, and the only one I hadn't played was this War of Mine. And reliably I got flack from people for that. And so I committed, I will play this War of Mine, I will see where it lands, and it's better than I expected. But still not good enough for me to keep based on what I'm looking for in a game. It's an incredibly well rated game, incredibly well loved, but it's a game of managing your resources and trying to survive as things get torn down around you. It's a game about the grim realities of war, which is just not what I'm looking for in a game. Now again, to its credit, it's better than I thought it would be. I thought I would hate the experience, and when I finished playing it, I was like, maybe I dive into it again? But I'd rather play other games, and so I, I'm not diving into another game. But I, but I did I did have that aspect. It has it has story. It has feeling. It has this journal you're flipping through that gives you these decisions and thinking through like, oh my gosh, will this thing explode in our faces? What happens when these survivors? Do we open that door? Do we welcome that person onto our crew? All these different decisions you have to make that are interesting and nuanced and, and give you a feeling for trying to survive as things collapse around you. And then at night, you know, you have beggars, you know, banging on your doors, taking your goods, and you're trying to survive as you slowly, inevitably just die or, or not die. You could win in the game too. Losing wasn't really my issue so much as the fact that it felt like mostly a lot of paperwork to get that sort of semi-grim aspect of war. I didn't actually mind the losing part as much as I thought I would. It was more just a more more tedious paperwork and doing things to get to a degree of storytelling and immersion. Again, better than I thought it would be. Still not a game that gives me the experience I am looking for. And lastly on the table, or not on the table, as it were, we have Machi Koro 2. I dove into Machi Koro 2, Pandasaurus' new version of Machi Koro. Ricky is someone who, Ricky, my daughter, is someone who has always liked, not always liked, that's not true. Ricky, my daughter, is someone who loved playing through Machi Koro Legacy. We played through the whole thing together, and so I got her Machi Koro 2 to dive into. Predictably enough, she really likes it. But I, I don't, I don't love Machi Koro. I never did. It's, I mean, it's okay. It's a three out of five. It's just, it's a game that I am fine playing. It. I, I always feel I'd rather play my preferred game, which is Valeria Card Kingdoms. Drastically preferred. Machi Koro was always not the same to me. And I couldn't really give you a firm reason why. They're basically the same idea of rolling dice and assigning them to the things you want to get more stuff. They're very similar. 
I just think I like the, the world, the art, the mechanics, the expansions of Valeria more, and Samachi Kara was always a fine game, while Valeria was always my go-to in that system. To be fair, by the way, Space Base, which I think is generally the one that's best rated, is also one that didn't do it for me. For me, my rating, my order is Valeria Car Kingdoms, then Space Base, then Machi Kara. That would be my order of those three systems. Although apparently I hear Bad Company is supposed to be really amazing, and I am very much looking forward to diving into that one when I have a chance. In any case, this has been my 28 games for the month of February. We're still ahead at the moment. I'm still like, I'm already like 15 games into March, so I'm charging ahead fully, getting as many games played as possible, trying to ensure that I stay ahead of the curve, because something I mentioned in the last video is if I fall behind, I plan on getting rid of games that I haven't even played to hit that shortfall. In any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.